I'm Bruce Fumi, and today I've brought you to a location used again and again in the hit TV series Outlander to tell you about the imaginary village of Cranes Muir and the real village of Kuros. If you haven't watched Outlander, it's a TV series created from Diana Gabaldon's books tracking a time-travelling English nurse on her adventures with a devastatingly handsome Jacobite Highlander. If you have watched Outlander, then you'll have seen this place. On those steps just leading up to the front door, the heroine Claire Randall pulled somebody's tooth out without an anaesthetic! Oh! In the room inside, Jamie Fraser, our clansman husband, promised to go on from Derby with Bonnie Prince Charlie when everyone else wanted to turn back to the Highlands. In the gardens behind this building, our heroine Claire met with Gellis Duncan. Now, there are other places in and around the town that were used in the series, but I'd like to tell you some history of the real Curis. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Now, you can see how well this 17th century village is preserved. This building, known as Curis Palace, was built by George Bruce. As you can see, he became a wealthy man. But how? Black diamonds. The area around here and elsewhere in Fife is known for coal. But that's not a 20th century thing. It's not even a 19th century thing. From times long past, it was known that around here you could find black rocks that would burn to give light and warmth. For centuries, these black diamonds had been dug by the monks from the monastery around here long before that house was built. But this is in the banks of the fourth estuary. Now, at the time, the estuary would have come right up to the road there, just in front of the statue of Thomas Cochrane Seawolf. I've got a video about him. The land in which that park and the Stirling Alla rail line sits is reclaimed land, and the area out there was used for salt pans. The ready supply of coal would be used to heat salt water, which evaporated, leaving salt to put in your chips, accompanied by vinegar in Glasgow and sauce in Edinburgh. Now, one of the things that you also get with coal mining is steelworks, and Curis became famous for a special type of griddle travelling soldiers used to cook oat bannocks over the fire. There's actually a record that Robert the Bruce ordered some here for his men. But they tended to overcook the dough, uh, which led to bannock burn. Anyway, you can imagine that as the monks dug the coal, in time the seams flooded with the water from the fourth and the coal mine fell into disuse. And then, in 1560, came the Reformation. Now, of course, ultimately that would have unintended consequences in terms of kings, crowns, covenanters and Jacobites some of them of the Outlander variety. But in the short term, the Reformation meant that the lands of Curis Abbey passed into the lay hands of the Colville family, one of whom appointed a smart relative called George Bruce to see if he could do anything with the mine. And did he ever. He came up with an ingenious system for extracting water from the mine shaft, allowing them to dig it deeper and reopen the mine. Hurrah! George made himself a fortune as he built this set to be used in Outlander. People came from all over James VI's kingdoms to find out how to use this technology. James VI himself visited on his only ever trip to Scotland after gaining the English crown. George Bruce was trying to persuade James to give Curis royal borough status so that he could export the coal abroad, and he arranged a tour of the mine. Bruce's system involved building a man-made island out in the fourth, and as part of the tour, Bruce took the famously cowardly king underground, along a shaft, and up to the island. When James realised that he was stranded and surrounded by water, he started shouting, Kidnap! Treason! Help! Help! 
Bruce had to calm him and explain it was just a demonstration of the mine system and there was a boat ready to take him ashore with a boatman called Guy Fox. The last bit's just a joke. Eight years later, three things happened. James VI died, George Bruce died, and the mine flooded again. It was never revived. Gradually, Curis fell into decline, and the surrounding towns and villages on both sides of the Forth forged ahead with coal and iron production. Curis became nothing but a derelict memory of the 17th century. But 400 years later, that derelict commercial and mining town would become the village of Cranesmuir in Outlander. Now, if you've watched Outlander, then you'll recognise this Mercat Cross. And you'll recognise that door out of which Claire Randall and Jamie Fraser exited with Gellis Duncan looking down from the window above as a poor wee laddie stood with his ear nailed to a wooden post here at the Mercat Cross. Claire fainted just over there, caused enough of a distraction for the gorgeous Jamie to release the boy without the crowd noticing. Hurrah for the elegant Englishwoman and the humane Highlander in the face of Presbyterian punishment. Now, this door has a National Trust symbol above it. As you go around the village, you'll see National Trust symbols on a number of the houses. You see, at one point, the whole town was to be redeveloped by the Stirling local authorities. You can only imagine the type of modern carbuncles that they might have created to replace these quaint 17th century houses. The National Trust first bought the palace and reinstated it, then bought houses around the village, renovated them and rented them out. So now you have this period film set that you can visit today. Personally, I pay £5.10 a month for National Trust membership. That gets me into the palace there, so long as I'm not filming this, and lots of other fantastic historical buildings. You can use my affiliate link in the description below to join the National Trust yourself. Why don't you? Your membership would also get you entry to Falkland Palace. Now, Falkland isn't just used for several more Outlander locations, it's also where I made a video about a real assassination attempt on James VI. It's called The Day the UK Nearly Didn't Happen. I'll leave a link at the end. But I've got one more thing to show you just outside the village, because in the title, I promised you a saint and you'll be particularly interested if you've got a Glasgow connection. This is the remains of St Mungo's Chapel. St Mungo is a patron saint of Glasgow. Some say the man who established Glasgow, but it all started here. You see, his mother was a 6th century princess of Gododdin across the Forth but she became pregnant by a foreign prince, who was also her cousin. The dirty floozy I hear you cry, cast her adrift in an open boat. Well, that is exactly what her dad, the king, did. But by a stroke of luck, favourable currents, or the hand of God, she drifted up the estuary rather than out to sea. She landed here on the Pictish side of the Forth, and on this spot, in 518 AD, she gave birth to a son. She named him Kentigan. Although St. Serf, the local abbot who took him in, called him Mungo. This was a miracle. If things had gone differently, Mungo could have grown up in a 1970s children's cartoon with two friends, Mary and Midge, but he grew up as a monk. Then, he crossed the forth to Earth, and there he met a dying hermit who asked Mungo to put him on a cart and push him as far as he could for burial. Wherever he stopped, he should set up a community. Well, this was a second miracle, because he managed to push that cart all the way to Glasgow, and he founded that dear green place. Why not come and visit Kouros, and why not use my affiliate link below to join the National Trust? In the meantime, my video on the day that the UK nearly didn't happen is coming up on screen now. I mean, the is going to be a lamb of life. Cheerio and Rasta.